Great. I think we can get started. I, I want to first thank all of you for coming. This was um, very short notice, even by my own standards. Uh, we put this together in about 48 hours, um, and um, but but I, I couldn't be more pleased to have two wonderful speakers. To my far left is Ali Ansari. Um, many of you have read his books. I would describe him as one of Iran's foremost historians, probably the foremost scholar of Iran um, in Europe. Uh, he's been at St. Andrews University for, for many years. He has, he has a new book out, which is called what, Ali? The History of Iran? Just, just the short very short introduction. Iran. Very yeah. short introduction to Iran. Short introduction. Oh, that series, that wonderful series. Short, sweet, cheap. <laughs> and uh, Nazi Lafati, I'm, I'm sure, is known to many of you. Uh, she did some marvelous reporting from Tehran when she was the New York Times uh, correspondent based there um, for, for about a decade, decade and a half. Uh, she had to leave Iran in 2009, and she's been outside, outside of Iran since 2009. Um, she also has a beautiful new book called The Lonely War, and um, we're not selling copies here, but she tells me if you buy a copy, she will uh, gladly sign them for you. <laughs> and and the, the title of our event today is, is uh, Lessons from History, because um, I think that um, it, one's perspective on where Iran is at today um, is informed by when you started looking at Iran. Um, if you started relatively recently, during the era of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, um, right now is an incredibly hopeful time because it's you know certainly um, a lot of progress is made um, compared to the time of Ahmadinejad when when the country was under severe internal pressure and external pressure as well. Um, but Nazila and Ali have the benefit of having started looking at Iran much sooner than that, during the time of former presidents Hashimi Rafsanjani and also the Khatami era. So I wanted to begin basically with a very broad question about where the two of you think we're at now, um, looking at, you know, in contrast to, say, the last three and a half decades of the Islamic Republic. Um, there's kind of three schools of thought at the moment. There's the very hopeful school, which says that if this nuclear deal happens, it's going to shine light on Iranian civil society and moderate forces who want to prioritize the country's national and economic interests before revolutionary ideology. And this is going to lead to uh, an internal transformation of the Islamic Republic. Um, you have a more pessimistic scenario laid out by some who argue that if you look at the history of the Islamic Republic, uh, and the, the few moments in which the regime has shown external flexibility, whether that's to end the Iran-Iraq war or nuclear detente, um, they clamp down internally to show their own population that don't think that our external flexibility signals internal weakness. And then there's, you know, kind of more muddling, muddling along, uh, more, more of the same. So just starting off with a very broad question about what is the, the mood you feel having covered um, three, four uh, uh, previous administrations in Iran? Are you, are you hopeful about where we're at today? Is the, the, the trend lines are positive or are you a bit more sober? Maybe I'll start with Nazila. Well, Karim, thank you so much for putting together this event. Um, uh, I, I think this is a very interesting question because uh, it is really hard to predict what will happen, but in many ways the past shapes the future. Uh, especially for people who have lived through those times. Uh, for me, uh, because I, I grew up in Iran, I lived through the war with Iraq, and I, and I was in Iran, I became a reporter in the years after the war ended. For me, this was a reminiscent of, I would say, about a year before the war ended. Uh, clearly, because there was a lot of hope. Um, the war had dragged out for eight years. I mean, we thought that it would just—it could just drag out for many, many more years, even after Khomeini's death. It, it had been uh, the best excuse to galvanize the nation behind an outside enemy. It was not about uh, anything other than stabilizing the foundations of a regime that was not popular at all. Uh, and the nuclear program was exactly the same thing. It served exactly the same purpose, to galvanize uh, all different factions who had started to oppose many of the major principles of the Islamic Republic uh, behind an outside enemy. And even though a lot of people didn't agree with the country's nuclear ambitions, they, they could never say anything. Because if they did, they were accused of, be, uh, accused of treason. 
Um, and now it, it seems to me that uh, Khamenei, Ayatollah Khamenei, is very much worried about the legacy that he's going to leave behind, the rumors that he is ill, whether he is or he's not. He's quite old. And he's very concerned about the legacy that he's going to leave behind. He does not have the charisma that Khomeini had. Uh, whatever he did was somehow justified because he was the supreme leader. Uh, Khamenei lacks the religious credentials that uh, Khomeini had. Yet after his death, uh, until this date, a lot of his allies, a lot of his close friends have criticized his policies to drag out the war, including uh, Rafsanjani. So uh, he, Khamenei is very much responsible for prolonging this uh, standoff with the West. And I think he has reached a point that he wants to make sure that he settles things before his death. But I do agree with you. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people on the ground, a lot of civil society actors, uh, opposition leaders, and they all say that they are worried that there's going to be a wave of crackdown after, after a political deal. Um, if you remember, after the ceasefire in 1988, over 3,000 people were secretly executed. That cannot happen. Such a thing on that scale cannot happen because of um, communication tools that people have, because of the internet, satellite TV. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if the hardliners inside the country go after uh, journalists, activists, uh, keep a lot of people in prison, and make hard, life harder for, for just society, for people, for women. There's that, there's that paradox, because on one hand, um, the people who are most enthusiastic about a potential nuclear deal within Iran are these moderate forces, civil society. So, and the people who are most concerned about that are the hardline forces who've thrived in isolation. But, but as I think you you allude to, um, how it will play out is is quite unpredictable. Adi, how would you answer the question of, um, you know, where where we're at today, what the trend lines are? Well, the the, the interesting thing is that the Iranians themselves, um, and certainly. Uh, the team behind Rouhani in his election campaign in 2013 basically drew this comparison and said actually that where we are now is, is, is almost you know, where we were in 1987 or 88 after this sort of devastating uh, eight-year war. And so it's, it's in some ways their own parallel sort of uh, argument, which is why also it has to be said that they emphasize that what needs to be done first and foremost is the economy and that political reform can wait. And I think one of the big mistakes uh, many people make abroad is uh, we tend to see in Rouhani, you know, Khatami redux. But this is simply, you know, unrealistic. Uh, one is that Khatami inherited a far different legacy in 1997. Um, and the direction of travel uh, was quite distinct, and we could see it. Rouhani has inherited a, a situation which I call basically a lost decade in Iran. I mean, the, the decade of Ahmadinejad has been, I think, you know, by most accounts, really quite disastrous for the country uh, and very, very destructive. So I think that the, 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 there is a, there's a, a, a period of, of possible transition uh, uh, the, uh, there, but I'm much more sanguine than I think many of those who are enormously optimistic uh, about the prospects for, for, certainly for political change. Um, for me, the, 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 the chief objective of the current negotiations is to lift sanctions. Um, and I always said, even at the time when Rouhani was, uh, when we had the first of a number of historic breakthroughs, I have to say, that we've had several in the last two years. And when Rouhani first uh, came in, um, I said there were three, you know, you can look at policy in Iran or the direction of travel in three sort of concentric circles. The most ambitious are those that really surrounded uh, Khatami or the, the, the sort of the, the reformists that did exist or weren't in prison who basically said that what we really need is a complete political transformation in the country. That was dismissed pretty quickly. I mean, that wasn't even a real, even, even a number of reformists thought that was far too ambitious. So there was a, a second circle, really, that surrounded Rafsanjani and basically said the, 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 the chief function now is really to get the economy back up and running because it's, it's just such a disaster. And I have to say, I mean, one of the striking things about Rouhani's uh, election is they really did then open the books. And uh, all of us who had been uh, railing against what Ahmadinejad had been up to, I think, were in many ways vindicated by you know what uh, even bar even accounting for the fact that a new government always 
uh, tries to say that the, the preceding government has been disastrous. I mean, this was pretty disastrous. Um, so, you know, there was this option. And I think for about three, four months, there was this argument that Rafsanjani, you know, could play quite a pivotal role. But I think we've seen over the last 18 months that Rafsanjani himself has also been sidelined. Uh, and we saw with the Assembly of Experts elections recently that actually he's, uh, he can't even win that election. I mean, you know, that's, that's getting a bit tough. And, you know, if, if your own son gets... Uh, um, uh, convicted to 15 years in prison, although whether he sits in prison for 15 years is neither here nor there. The fact is that even Rafsanjani can't protect his, uh, his, his offspring. Uh, that looks also very, uh, uh, you know, a, a non-starter. So really, you know, what we're looking at is to get the sanctions lifted. And I think that's the chief sort of tactical, even you could say strategic aim. And what comes after that, who knows? I mean, that's not very clear at all. Uh, and what you will know is that the uh, and what I have said, and I looked very closely at this, if you look in the last 18 months of the Rouhani administration, there has been very little, if any, structural or you know, serious political change or even tentative political change taking place. In fact, uh, it seems to be that the deal has been cut, that you can have a free reign over the negotiations, but you will not touch the domestic political or economic situation. So what does that mean if all this money goes back into the system? Well, you know, it will go into the regular into the regular routes. So it will basically consolidate and support those very groups of people who have been, spent the last 10 years consolidating a very authoritarian state structure. This is something that I think we just need to be realistic about. It's not to argue against anything, but it's just simply to say that I think those of us who are hoping for a new dawn, I think need to be a little bit more sober about it and, and, and pay a little bit more attention to what's going on domestically. Uh, do you agree, Nazila, that looking at it, this from the perspective of the Supreme Leader, if there is going to be a nuclear compromise for, for the leader. This is more tactical than it is strategic, meaning um, he's not going to, after you know, 35 years uh, in, 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 in power, 26 years as supreme leader, he's not thinking of abandoning the policies he's been pursuing um, um, and, and shifting to more cooperation or more of an alliance with the United States. This is kind of more tactical with the aim of, of regrouping economically, getting the sanctions lifted. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think Khamenei has uh, been, been even very open about some of the principles that he's not going to back down from. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, rapprochement with the United States is something that he has explicitly talked about. He has said that uh, the nuclear talks are not about uh, mending diplomatic ties with the United States. And uh, if, if this was not on his agenda, he wouldn't have talked about it. If he talks about something, that means he cares about it, and this is still one of the red lines uh, in the Islamic Republic. Uh, but you know, the nuclear program, I don't think was among those uh, major uh, principles, one of the foundations of the Islamic Republic. Khamenei has always seen himself very much as, as the protector of what he inherited. I don't think he would have been this, this, uh, this kind of person or would have pursued these policies if he had not become supreme leader. He was a much more moderate figure before he was appointed as supreme leader. But somehow, uh, Iran, I think, got caught in this a uh, nuclear program that turned into a very costly, uh, both politically and economically, economic program. And uh, they have reached a point that they, uh, he thought towards the end of his life, if he didn't uh, solve this problem, uh, it would overshadow his legacy forever and ever. But I don't think uh, the nuclear program uh, ending the standoff has anything to do with rapprochement with the United States. Having said that, Zarif and Kerry have spoken with each other in the past 18 months much more than Iran and the United States have ever had any kind of diplomatic engagement. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely a new era, but I don't think uh, Khamenei is planning to change Iran's foreign policy. You know, one of the things that um, we, we've stopped talking about in the last several years is the a civil society movement within Iran. After 2009, we saw massive, um, uh, massive protest movements. But um, since then, it's been fairly dormant. Um, the, the leadership or the nominal leadership of the opposition, <coughs> Musavi Karabi, are still uh, under house arrest. Um, many of the other leaders are, are either remain in prison or have been, been exiled. Um, how would you describe kind of the state of that movement within Iran? I, I think using the term opposition movement um, ascribes 
more cohesion than, than, than exists, right? It's just kind of a group of individuals who are discontent with the status quo. But, you know, what is the, what, what would you describe as kind of first, what, you know, what, what's, what is the state of those, those, those forces? What is their alternative vision for Iran? And then maybe I'll, I'll ask both of you to talk about this um, new idea of Reform 3.0. So please, Ali, why just... Well, I mean, I, I think the, the mood music is certainly better. I mean, the mood music is uh, a little bit more encouraging. I think uh, most of the people I talk to say that the one thing we have in abundance is hope, which is, which is great. Uh, but in practical terms, I mean, you get the distinct impression that, that any sort of civil society in, a, in, a, in, a, in the authentic use of that term is fairly dormant and very wary. I mean, as one would expect. I mean, I think 2009 was a very, very serious moment in that. Uh, in that experience. And again, you know, I would say that, and I think Carrie made the point very well, you know, you're talking here with people who would have, you know, been familiar with what was going on in the 90s and in the Khatimi era. And I think, you know, that gives us a very different perspective as to what is possible. Uh, I think if you, if you have your experience in the Ahmadinejad era, you think what's going on now is at least better than nothing. And I think that's fair enough. I mean, it's better than nothing because they had nothing. Uh, and now, there's, there's, as I said, the mood music has changed. But I think in practical terms, you know, there's been a lot really staked on the fact that the nuclear negotiations will deliver. So basically, everything has been kept, uh, uh, has been delayed, in effect, until, you know, the nuclear negotiations unlock the possibility of other things happening. But there, you know, again, I think that's, I mean, there was a very interesting t statistic came out recently. I was uh, mentioning this. It's only in the, in the recent budgets. They said that, and as we know, the economy in Iran is not in great shape. Um, and they were saying uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the, uh, Rouhani has had to slash cultural and uh, other budgets by about 60% over the last couple of years, which one would expect. We're all suffering from austerity, obviously. Uh, but somehow the, the policing budget has been increased this year by 35%. So, you know, we know that certain priorities are still, uh, 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 can still be attended to. I mean, you can understand in some ways that you want to make sure the internal security of the country is in check. Uh, particularly if you're going to go through a, 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 a tough economic time. So, but it does, it does allow you, in a sense, you know, a, a, a little bit of an insight into the, their sort of thinking. You know, Rouhani, at the end of the day, he comes from a very strong um, security background. Um, you know, he's a, he's, he certainly doesn't have a background, uh, as Hatemi did, in a sort of the arts and culture and other things. You know, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a much more... Uh, uh, it's a much more insider role, which, which has you know, positive and negative consequences, of course. You can read it however which way you want. But if you look at what's been happening, I don't think really you've had the same sort of encouragement to local organizations and, and, and even the sort of the quite modest uh, growth in civil society that you had in the, in the late 1990s. Um, and even then, by the way, I mean, we shouldn't be romantic about it. Even then, you know, during the Khatami era, it was tough. I mean, it wasn't that easy. I mean, they kept shutting things down, then they kept reopening. So it wasn't exact, but at least there was something happening. Now, I think it's, a, it's a, I think people are very wary, and they want to sort of basically uh, 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 watch from the sidelines and see what's happening before they actually stick their heads above the parapet. Yeah, I often find that um, one's analysis of Iran is dependent on your your hopes and your expectations for the country. If you're kind of uh, an American analyst of the Middle East and you compare Iran to Saudi Arabia, you say, well, you know, this women can drive and, you know, people vote. And, and so we should be, um, you know, very, very hopeful about Iran or, or much more positive about Iran. I think if you're someone like Ali, who, you know, those of us who've, who've, who, who uh, in some ways have, a personal stake in it. You obviously never want to conflate your hopes and your analysis, but you have greater expectations for the people of Iran. Um, you know, obviously that leads you to, to more disappointment. But, but Nazila, how do you see the future of this reform movement? And maybe you can talk a little bit about um, this movement, which is taking shape under the leadership of Sadiq Harrazi, who was a former um, acolyte. He was the former Iranian ambassador to Paris. He's related to the Supreme Leader by marriage, and he's trying to start a new reform movement which is somehow aligned with the Supreme Leader rather than against him. Well, I, I want to be clear about how I use the word reform. I think the reform movement that Khatami initiated in 1997, uh, that is gone. I don't want to say is dead, but that has disappeared. Uh, its leaders are in jail. Uh, a lot of uh, those who are not in jail are not inside the country or outside the country, and its supporters were very much disappointed in 1999. I think 
uh, that reform movement lost uh, its core supporters after uh, Khatami failed to stand up to the system and uh, side with, uh, with the opposition leaders in 99. Um, uh, those people continue to support Khatami only because there was no other alternative. He seemed to be the only person who was speaking their language, was talking about uh, what they wanted. Uh, but the, the, the reform movement in the sense that was created in 1997, I think, somehow vanished. Sadiq Kharazi, I think, is uh, just being an opportunist, unfortunately. Uh, he, he's been calling about the third generation uh, of reformers. I don't know what happened to the second generation. And a lot of people have been asked, Nasli Sevom Eslahat Neda. Isn't it called Neda? Oh, okay, Nasli Dovom. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so anyways, everybody's wondering what happened to those people. Those people are still in prison. So how can you talk about um, another generation? Um, and a lot of young people started uh, making fun of what he was doing because he has aligned himself to the supreme leader, who is the man who went after the reformers. But I am generally very optimistic about the idea of reform in Iran. And I think that is a totally different thing uh, than the reform movement and the leaders of the reform movement. I think reform in Iran uh, and people's um, longing for change hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, and I think, in fact, Iranian middle class has grown uh, tremendously, uh, even under uh, Ahmadinejad, partly because he was very generous with the, with the security forces, with the militia forces, uh, with his own supporters. He put them on very, uh, very uh, generous retainers, and these people moved up in society, joined the middle class, and I, I got to know a lot of them. Once they moved up in society, they were, they were not radical anymore. Uh, they, they were not talking about the things that they spoke about a few years earlier. So the, the middle class has grown. And I, I used to speak to a lot of opposition leaders inside the country, and they used to very openly say that if the government left us alone, if this regime was, was not so intrusive, we didn't care about politics. But we live in a society that the regime cares about who we hang out with, we, how we party, what kind of music we can listen to. And, and that makes people frustrated. So I think for the majority of Iranians, political freedom does not come first. I think for the majority, especially for the middle class, which uh, combining the lower middle class, middle class and the upper middle class, and it is over 80%, it is more about social freedoms, about personal space. And um, their longing for that ki kind of reform hasn't gone anywhere. I think it's simmering beneath the surface. Even in uh, 2008, I think the majority of people who came out were part of this movement, part of a civil movement, uh, rather than a civil society that was organized. And I, I think uh, they can come out again, but they are not willing to make the kind of sacrifices that the Egyptians and the Tunisians made partly because they're middle class. People from the middle class tend to act very differently. They are very much afraid of um, any kind of institutional breakdown. Many of them either remember or their parents have lived through uh, the 1979 revolution and the first decade of the revolution that was during a war. And people don't want to live through that era anymore. Mm. I have one more question for both of you, and then I'll hand it over to all of you. So have your your question's ready, but let me ask you to both speculate a little bit and let's play out a scenario in the next year and then the next 10 years. That over the next year, um, I suspect that um, the nuclear deal, um, I, I don't see it, this as either kind of success or failure, I think it's either success or stalemate. Mm -hmm. um, we're not gonna declare it a failure, but it could take longer than June 30th. And you know, if the deal, if the nuclear deal isn't signed anytime soon, I think the vast majority of Americans probably won't notice. It's not going to affect people's day-to-day -day lives in the United States, whereas in Iran, people are on the edge of their seat. Um, they're you know, waiting for this deal to happen to even make minor life decisions, whether to you know, buy a house or buy a mobile phone or, or whatever. And so the, the, the question is, play this out over the next year. There's, in a way, much more pressure on the Supreme Leader to sign this deal than there is President Obama. Um, um, and so, so over the next year, how does this play out within Iran if there's no deal? That's question one. Um, question two is to look over the longer term, say the next decade, decade and a half. And the, I think the two most 
commonly comparative paradigms which um, are invoked to try to capture the Islamic Republic and its future trajectory are China and the Soviet Union. You know, uh, is, is Iran a, a mini China or is it a mini Soviet Union? Um, um, you know, a country which starts to prioritize economic interests first before revolutionary ideology. It opens up economically, um, it becomes you know, economic power, um, but it keeps the political space for itself, so that's, that's China. But you know, somehow it manages to, to evolve. And then the opposite of that is the Soviet Union, a country which continues to prioritize ideological interests before economic interests, and eventually it implodes under the weight of its own internal malaise. Um, so, so, you know, near-term scenario, longer-term scenario, just ask you to, to speculate. Ali, why don't you say? I think it's probably, you know, I always feel it's like the Soviet Union struggling to be China. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are these tensions. I mean, the, the, the difficulty in ever sort of categorizing Iran in, 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 in nice, neat compartments, it's, it's always very difficult because obviously there are many different groups competing. And even, you know, an individual in Iran will have several different opinions. I mean, it's, you know, and they will move and shop and change depending on their mood, but also how events uh, play out. Uh, I think there's been a lot of talk, you know, in Iran for many, many years, by the way. I mean, none of these discussions are new. I mean, this is one of the things that always, I have to say, is I'm being a bit of a crusty historian here, but it gets a bit sort of irritating when you hear all these uh, people coming up with these fantastic discoveries they've made about Iran. And I sort of say, well, you know, actually, you know, these discussions have been had for at least the last 25 years, and we haven't really progressed much further, unfortunately. And so the China model or the Japan model or this or that or the other has always been there. I mean, it's been discussed quite heavily, and I think Rafsanjani was the first talk of the China model. The, the problem, unfortunately, with a lot of this is when you actually probe a little bit deeper, they don't actually know what the China model is. I mean, this is the difficulty. And the China model is actually having relations with the United States and opening up and, 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 and having a, a degree of managed, obviously, economic development, but one in which basically capitalism replaces communism. Now, in Iran, they haven't really made that decision yet. I mean, that, that, that prob they, they, they're, they're very reluctant to give up control. I mean, this is, this is part of the problem. And in discussions, you know, I used to have extensive uh, uh, discussions with businessmen and, 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 and entrepreneurs as far as they were in the 1990s and others. And, and you know, they, they, there's a very strong nationalist urge in Iran to be able to be self-sufficient to do things on your own. And they would, you know, eventually come to the conclusion that actually this revolutionary urge isn't getting us anywhere. You know, we can't, we can't compete in an international environment. So we do have to engage with the world. But ultimately now today, you know, and certainly in that lost decade, as I said, when actually a lot of the economic resources of the country moved from that quote, I would put in quotation marks, private sector, because it's not a private sector as we would understand it, but into a sort of an IRGC backed, you know, foundations, very tightly controlled. It's much more difficult to en envisage that happening uh, um, uh, easier. In, 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 you know, in, uh, without a bit of a push. I mean, this is one of the things that I think is always very important. I remember many years ago having uh, lunch with Said Hajarian, who was the strategic thinker for the reformists at the time, just before they shot him. And, uh, um, and he's a wonderful metaphor for the reform movement in Iran because they never killed him, but he's you know, basically not uh, uh, incapacitated, obviously. And he made this very good analogy. He said, you know, we want to persuade people to come with us. You know, we want people to come towards the reform way. But we know, we're realistic enough to know that these, you know, these stakeholders, these people who own the means of production, if I can use a slightly Marxist term, in uh, Iran, um, they will never give up control unless we can push a bit, unless we can use a bit of people power to push. And I think that's always the, the, the essence in Iran, that actually these vested interests will never give up willingly. I mean, there's no sort of, you know, there has to be certain pressures. And I think the economy, of course, is one of those areas that might push them in a direction. But this idea at the moment that you're going to see a shift towards either a sort of a China model in the next few years without something quite significant breaking uh, or pushing them in that direction is something that I, I think at the moment is probably a little bit too optimistic. Um, you know, if you look at their relationship, their, their, their chief international relationship at the moment is with the Russians. And they, they follow Putin quite closely, and Putin, I think, and Khamenei share a similar worldview. I read somewhere someone said that uh, Obama and Khamenei share a similar worldview. I think that's pushing it a bit. But, uh, um, you know, these are uh, attempts to, to, to make things sound rosier than they are. I think Khamenei has a particular worldview, he, he, and, 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 you know, he's very adamant that he wants to keep uh, that sort of uh, control. And you can see this all the, also with the nuclear negotiations. You know, for me, uh, my, my heart, in a sense, says that you know, we're going to get somewhere. My head tells me all the time that this is going to be a lot more difficult than people are saying. 
And uh, if we talk of the June 30th, you know, I think even the, the, the mere fact of sitting down and writing this document in a way that is not going to be uh, misinterpreted is going to be a task that a number of lawyers are going to have a thoroughly good time doing uh, for many, many months. I cannot see this being written in the time frame that they're talking about. Um, but, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll pile in with hundreds of lawyers to go in and, and write this document. I just can't see it. I think it's going to take longer. I think you've got to find a document, and it's insufficient, by the way. I hear too many people say to me, well, there's diplomatic spin. You can fudge things. You can do this. You can word it in this way that they can take it in one sense and someone can take it in another sense. That isn't going to work. The minute you write a document that can be interpreted in different ways by the different parties, it's a recipe for disaster. So it's got to be a document that's clear. And I think those of you, will, many of you here will know much better than me that any international treaty of any sort, although it's not a treaty, of course, it's an agreement, uh, is going to require you know, a lot of heavy work. So I think this is going to be a longer-term affair. We, we will get to something. Uh, I'm not sure uh, quite what it will entail. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, something else will have to give. Uh, something else will have to give either from the White House or in the leadership office because there are a number of areas where the disagreements remain quite striking. And they've been very blunt about it. And just in case, you know, Khamenei, from his point of view, he doesn't want to be misunderstood, so he gives his wonderful speech in Persian. He makes sure it's translated to English and put on his website. He then offers his own fact sheet, just to make sure you just don't know. Then he has his tweets that he sends out, just to let you know, just in case you misinterpreted them again. Then he tells you what he thinks his red lines are. So something we'll have to give there. And I mean, I think there's a certain amount of optimism on this side of the Atlantic that Khamenei will be the one that gives. I think one of the best comments I heard was something about him having to contain his constituents, his hardline constituents. Uh, I think most people who know Iran would wonder which hardline constituents these are. Maybe he's talking in the mirror. I mean, I, you know, the, the chief person that you have to convince is him. The chief person you have to convince is him. You know, and, 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 this is, this is a, and he has a legacy, but he also has uh, concerns that he doesn't want to leave um, uh, a legacy that has Iran as weak or, or submitting. So, you know, there, there, there is still, I think, a way to go. And um, a lot has been achieved, and I think it's very encouraging that Kerry and Zarif like to talk to each other so extensively. I think that's very positive. Good. Let's take that for what it's worth. But I think we need to, you know, we, we, we need to be quite sober going forward to make sure that all those areas of disagreement are also, uh, are also uh, uh, reconciled. Um, I tend to agree with Ali. I think this is going to take much longer than that, uh, what we might expect. And, and Iranians are already warning Iranians about it. I mean, there are a lot of op-eds in Iranian papers, a lot of Iranian officials, especially people in charge of uh, commerce, economy. The Minister of Economy have been talking about it, have been warning about, uh, uh, about a deal. They've been saying that even if there is a deal in June, things are not going to change They're for a long, to long time. expectations. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, they, they've been saying that it's going to take years and years to get all the sanctions lifted, which is very different that, than what Khamenei said just two weeks ago, uh, which again raises the, 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 the topic whether Khamenei is unaware of these facts or he was speaking to an Iranian audience. He wanted to make sure that he's addressing some of the concerns of uh, those people that he had steered their emotions against a nuclear deal saying that uh, we are on top of this, we're, uh, we're, we're watch, watching everything carefully, we will make sure that Iran's interests are guaranteed. But everybody else in the country is just warning about the consequences. They're saying things are not going to change for years and years, that the sanctions uh, that were put in place under Saddam have not been completely uh, lifted uh, now in Iraq. Uh, so Iranians, I think, are very aware, but the psychological effects of, of this, of the deal, of, uh, of the agreement so far, has had huge uh, effect. Uh, People, I think, are feeling much more positive. They are seeing the future in a much different way uh, than they did before this, this agreement. Um, whether, China, whether Iran is um, going the Chinese way or the Russian way, I think none, uh, I, I, for, for many different reasons. I think, uh, first of all, Iran and Iranians are a country that have been very much uh, shaped by their own past. I mean, starting. Uh, from the religion, Shiite Islam, uh, they were inv invaded uh, by the Muslims, and they, they became Muslims, but they never became Sunni Muslims. Uh, I mean, they became Shiite Muslims over a period of centuries. They, 
they shaped Islam into a kind of Shiite, Shiite Islam that was more Persianized than anything else. I mean, for Iranians uh, are, are people that they have survived centuries and centuries of invasions. They have to learn uh, to adapt themselves, be pragmatist, um, uh, live in harmony with their surroundings, and come up with um, policies that were, would uh, 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 secure their survival. I think for the Islamic Republic, it's exactly the same thing. The revolutionary ideology of 1979, I think, died after Khomeini's death along with him. If you listen to Khomeini's talks or even to Musavi's uh, talks uh, when Khomeini was alive, it's a totally different discourse. The lexicon, the, the words that they use are, are very different than the way any of them speaks now, even Khamenei. Uh, I think we are living in an era that the Islamic Republic is very much concerned with uh, survival uh, and uh, the, the revolutionary ideology, ideas of exporting the revolution, they, they are non-existent. And, and for, the, for the same reason, Khamenei, when he came to power, he did not stick together with Khomeini's allies. He alienated all of them. Uh, he brought people to power who were not clerics, who were not religious. They were quite military figures, and they were dependent on him for survival. And he has made sure to replace them at least every 10 years so they wouldn't become very powerful. So predicting the future of Iran, I think, is a big mistake. This is what you have said yourself. <laughs> uh, uh, but whatever is going to be is not going to be a Chinese or a Russian model. Mm -hmm. OK, let's uh, open it up. If you can identify yourself and be brief as possible. Let's start in the back, and we'll move forward. And I can actually bunch together a few questions, so please, sir. Hi, I'm Hamid Yunus from Gallup. Uh, thank you for an excellent, extremely nuanced uh, discussion on Iran. I was wondering uh, what your take is, the panelists and also Kareem, uh, on if there is more money coming into that system, uh, as one of you sort of implied, what will Iran's regional behavior look like? Will it be more aggressive, less aggressive, more reliant on proxies, less reliant on proxies? Um, what's that dynamic? What does that look like for, from where you sit? OK, well, actually, we can go one by one. Why don't, uh, Ellie, do you want to start with the first one? Well, it's it's interesting because I mean there is a view that if that all that money comes in and they will uh, you know they, they they will flex their muscles a bit more in uh, in the region. I think certainly that will make life a bit easier for them in terms of supporting Assad and, and 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 other proxies or other allies they have. I'm not so sure, to be honest, that it means they're going to be even more aggressive in the region. I mean, I think they they've probably reached the limits of actually what they. Uh, should really be getting up to if we count Yemen and other things that are, that are going on. And I know that uh, Jafari and the others have been very, uh, uh, you know, the IRGCP have been very um, uh, almost boastful. I mean, there are a couple of mainly, they're mainly Ahmadinejad acolytes, I have to say, who are saying, you know, we dominate all these capitals and this sort of thing. Um, I think many other of the more politically uh, intelligent class in Iran, if I may say so, are probably a little bit more circumspect about making these claims because it's the sort of attention they may not like. And I thought there was quite an interesting encounter, obviously, recently when the Iranian naval ships sort of turned back when the, when was it, the Teddy Roosevelt sort of turned up. Um, I, I tend to see that Iran has a very good public relations impact abroad. Some of it is true. There's no doubt about it. But they tend to puff themselves up. Uh, I think they have very strong allies, by the way, in Israel who tell them, you know, that they are the most uh, existential threat in the world. I think there's many people in Saudi also probably think that. And that probably encourages them to think that they are. You know, I mean, obviously, if they're all saying that we're the worst thing since sliced bread, then maybe we are doing pretty well. But, you know, I would just remind us all, and everyone seems to have forgotten about this, but a couple of months ago, they built a cardboard cutout of a U.S. ship and blew it up for the spectacle of its officials. And this was taken as some sort of great um, moment of Iranian power. Um, I thought it was vastly embarrassing, I have to say myself. Um, uh, and you know, this idea that this mock-up was a way of showing that they could handle the United States. I think in this respect, Obama is quite right that you know, they don't pose a threat to the United States. They don't pose a threat in that sense of the region. They have the p potential to cause a lot of uh, mischief. Although at the same time, you know, from an Iranian perspective, you know, you'd have to say to be, you know, to be on balance fair you know, that they could quite rightly point out, I think, to the way in which the West has also interfered, obviously, in the region. I don't think the last decade has really shone a great light on the uh, strategic nous of Western planners either. So you know, it's, it, they would say there's a mess in the region, and they're you know taking opportunities as, as they arise. But I think the money itself, you know, will not necessarily mean you know that anything will get particularly worse in that respect, or they'll be more aggressive. 
I think a lot of them will just enjoy the fact that they can get richer. Uh, you know, and that's, uh, uh, um, that's something that uh, I think will be the main consequence. And actually, ironically, I mean, in some ways, if the money goes in and the, and the structures of the state are the same, you know, it will flow out again because they'll be buying lots of Western goods. I mean, that's all that will happen, really. So the money will go in and it will come out. And it will probably go to Dubai and other places where it will be stashed in some lovely bank accounts. So, you know, it's, it's just the system as it works. Unless you make some serious structural changes to the economy of the country, that's what's going to happen, which is, you know, which is something that I think bears some reflection. Uh, I saw a headline, that, uh, I'm not sure if it was confirmed or not, but that Iran is going to be invited to partake in the next, they're going to try to reopen um, dialogue on Syria. Yeah, well, that would be very will be important. invited to that. Do you see, Nazila, a potential that in the aftermath of a potential nuclear deal, a lot of caveats there, that Iran's regional policies will, will, will uh, th there's room for flexibility and modification on those regional policies, or... Would you expect more of the same? Well, you know, I think uh, it all depends on who's going to be involved in the talks and which faction in Iran has the upper hand, whether it's the moderates or uh, the hardliners and hardliners, I, I, I mean the revolutionary guards. Uh, uh, but I think we, we cannot forget two points about Iran and the Islamic Republic, and, and that includes both the, both the moderates and uh, the hardliners. First is the question of legitimacy. All Iranian officials, uh, whether it's Zarif uh, and Rouhani or it's Khomeini and his Revolutionary Guards commanders, since Khomeini's death, they have all been seeking legitimacy, partly because under Khomeini, Iran did not uh, have that kind of legitimacy. Everybody was waiting for, for, for this regime to collapse. Uh, they have proven over the past two decades, over uh, two decades, that no, they are very much in control. They're going to be there. The Islamic Republic is not going anywhere. But still, the regime has, has not received the kind of recognition that, that it wanted. Number two is uh, uh, being a regional power. And I think that doesn't make any difference, whether it's the Shah or the Islamic Republic or a different regime. Uh, Iran lives in a very lonely place, surrounded by Afghanistan, uh, Sunni Muslims, Pakistan with a nuclear deal. I think anyone who is in power in Iran uh, wants to have some kind of, uh, uh, be a regional power, have influence in the area. Iranians have been taking advantage of, uh, of problems in the region. I mean, the only reason Iran has managed to expand its reach in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, is because of uh, the laws that, that have occurred there. Uh, Assad has been a very good ally. They don't want him to, uh, to see him leave. And I think there are a lot of other countries in the region that they don't want uh, to see Assad leave because uh, Syria will probably uh, f uh, collapse into a a uh, situation like uh, Libya or Iraq and another uh, civil war that is going to be very destabilizing for the region. So I think as long as they can secure those two concerns, legitimacy and being an important regional player in the country, uh, they can shift their policies. Mm. Great. Uh, Gary here in the front. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, uh, and I write the Mitchell Report. And... Um, I've been trying to think of another way to pose this question, and I can't so I'll pose it this way. Um, if, if, we, if we try to get inside the head of um, how many, and uh, in doing so, we could <clears throat> use some, some uh, new brain science, um, what, what of two factors that I'm going to name, and maybe th th there are others. What what is m most central to his uh, to his being, to his way of thinking, th that he's a Persian or a Muslim? Good question. <laughs> Ali, you want to tell well, me first? Well, I think he publicly say he's a Muslim. I think, uh, and but you know, you you could. I mean, actually, you would probably be the best person to answer. Uh, the uh, if you look at his uh, the way he has transitioned. I mean, from being president to leader. You know, obviously, in some ways, the role has made the man, and he's surrounded by people who tell him that he his his role is a very specifically, you know, uh, Muslim leadership role. Although he does often aspire to a leadership role that's even wider than that occasionally. Um, 
But originally, you know, I mean, he's been known actually as someone who has very strong Persian uh, sympathies, if I can put it that way. You know, uh, is very fond of uh, uh, certainly the language and literature of his of his native land. But I think on a his his public persona and certainly the way he's uh, he's developed certainly over the last ten years. And if you look at his writings, it's it, it's basically dominated by a uh, um, a Muslim uh, narrative. Uh, but you could say, what Nazil was saying in a sense, I mean, you could say it would be a, a Persian Muslim narrative as opposed to uh, a, a, a broader thing, although he could not possibly say that publicly. But if you look at, I mean, one of the interesting things I have to say, I mean, I always thought, and these are all these surprises, you know, I mean, I always thought that one of the great tasks that the, the, the regime would have to do in the uh, post-Rohani was to rebuild its bridges. I mean, it doesn't have to... You don't have to be affectionate, but you rebuild its bridges with the Saudis. But actually, if you look at uh, Khamenei's comments about the Saudis and 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 uh, and, and uh, uh, um, you know so his comments, you know they 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 could fit in rather than you know I it, historically speaking, you know it's 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 a it's almost a very Persian, how should we say, approach to the to the Saudis and and and, and the uh, the Arabs of the region. I mean, it's 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 quite striking. Uh, but in his own mind, it would have to be, you know, his, his view is a, is, is, is a Muslim one, and it's the Islamic revolution that he's there to protect. I mean, that's his role, and that's what they would have told him, and that's, it would be, you know, it will be impressed upon him, and I think over the last 10 years, he's basically absorbed that. I mean, that's basically what he's become. I totally agree with that, Ali. I don't really have anything to add to it. I think Islam has become a part of a Persian's identity as well. It, I mean, the two of them are nothing that can be totally, uh, completely separated. Um, Iranians have taken Islam, Persianized it, and it's now part of their culture. Uh, and when we talk about secular Iran or desires for having a secular Iran, I think that's not going to happen in a true sense. In, uh, I think uh, Islam is always going to be part of people's daily culture. Uh, it's, it's become a way of life in Iran. Uh, but Persian ambitions are definitely there and stronger than uh, I, a, a, a solely religious identity. I think it's a combination of both that, both of them. I think society, I mean, is is you know moving in a very Persian direction. By the way, I mean, and I think also there's a distinction between the Islam of the Islamic Revolution and people's general sort of popular Islam that people might follow. I mean, if you look at it in, in society as a whole, I mean, one of the great paradoxes of Iran, by the way, is society has consistently been way ahead of its politics. I mean, this is this is one of the paradoxes of Iran. And so people who travel to Iran are always slightly bewildered because you look at society and it seems to be actually quite secular in, a, in, a, in an Anglo-Saxon way, I should say, not a French way. Um, but uh, but um, it's, it's the politics that are now, you know, uh, 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 sort of waiting to catch up really with what's going on at a, at a, at a societal level. And I think you find very strong Persian elements there. I mean, one of the great, and I work on this a lot because my field is nationalism, really, um, is how, and if you want to look at it, is how Cyrus the Great has become a, a basically a prophet. Yeah, I mean, it's complete junk, but it's, it's an interesting way, and they, they have, they have co-opted a, a strongly Persian narrative and legitimized it by giving it a veneer of Islam, which obviously doesn't make any sense, but, you know, that's not the point. The point is, is that you bring these all in, uh, and... Uh, uh, there was a very famous newspaper headline, uh, which actually Khamenei's brother, who's the head of the Iran, the, the uh, Iranian Studies Foundation, um, said that Cyrus the Great was the founder or the progenitor of monotheism. Well, okay. Uh, I think there'd be many Muslim scholars that might sort of get worried about that. But I mean, that's it shows that they are, you know, trying to co-opt nationalism into a, into a wider sort of. Uh, uh, into a wider narrative. So, you know, there are lots of gray areas with that, really. There are lots of gray areas. Yeah. I mean, I'll just add to that. I don't want to get too technical, yeah. but, but Khamenei is actually a Turk. He's not, yeah. he's Azeri. He's not yeah. uh, ethnically Persian. Um, so I would distinguish between Iranian and Persian as well. And the reason why I say this is that I, I hear oftentimes from um, people in the Gulf who say that, well, you know, Iran says that we have um, tension between Sunnis and Shiites or Kurds and Arabs and Iran is itself a, a, you know, a diverse polity. You have half the population Persian, quarter Azari, you have 
Kurds, um, Baluchis, Arabs. Um, but I think what is unique about Iran is that a lot of those groups still have, um, there's not, um, there is this kind of strong I Iranian identity, whether your, your mother tongue is Azeri or it's, or it's Persian, but specifically to the question of whether he feels like he's more Muslim or more Iranian. When I did this study of Khamenei years back, and I haven't checked his website to confirm this is still the case, but at that time, um, on his website, it said yeah. the supreme leader of the Islamic world. It didn't say the supreme leader of Iran. So he had these kind of um, grander ambitions mm -hmm. than just being the leader of Iran. And we saw that in 2011 when the uprisings happened um, in the Arab world. Um, that we call it here the Arab Spring, and, and, and in Iran they call that the Islamic Awakening. And they, they thought that they were kind of the leaders of that Islamic Awakening because it was following the lead of the 1979 revolution, which was a movement against local uh, Western-backed uh, autocrats. Um, the, the, the last point I'd make, and it's, it's not, um, it's, it's tangential, but this question about um, whether the leadership in Iran puts their Islamic identity first or their, their Iranian identity first. Um, just on a personal level, I, I noticed that it is unique in the history of Iran how the Islamic Republic really seems to court Arabs, um, Shiite Arabs in particular, and repel Iranians, secular Iranians in particular. Um, the, the number of uh, Arab Shiite colleagues I see from universities and think tanks who are moving back and forth between whether it's the West or Iraq, they visit Iran frequently, they have much, much better access than um, many Iranians do who are, you know, <laughs> sitting, have been sitting out the last, you know, decade, decade and a half in, in the West and elsewhere. So, so I see that these, they, they kind of see in Shiite Arabs stronger allies than they do um, secular Iranians. So let me, um, I, I want to bring in a female voice if there is any. Uh, yeah, please, in the front, yeah. Hi, my name is Barbara Dello. Um, I, Iran has a very old culture, my dad always said, back thousands of years, um, with traditions and a special identity. Um, you, talk, you talk a lot about moderate influences. Um, how willing are the people to give up their old traditions and identity, and does that vary geographically within the country? Okay, let me, let me add, a, this gentleman here in the front had also a question. Did you have a question, sir? I wanted to ask an economic question, and that is, do you see, think that it is possible that the future main or leading uh, trade and investment partner of Iran will not be Western countries, but actually China. And what might the political and economic consequences of that be? Right. There was uh, one more here in the, in the center. Faison. Um, yeah, fourth row. Hi, my name is Farzan Sabet. I'm a visiting fellow at Georgetown uh, University. Um, so thank you all for wonderful presentations. Um, so basically, my, I'm just going to set up brief pretext for my question. It seems that at least until the 2005 election, the conflict between Iranian centrism and reformism undermined both the goals of economic and political reform, and was actually a factor in Ahmadinejad's victory. But since 2013, there seems to have been some kind of rapprochement between the two camps. So mm -hmm. has the Rouhani administration and the broader reform movement, whether second or first generation, uh, learned from this experience? And will this, to some extent, uh, how will this, to some extent, help advance both the goals of economic and political reform during Rouhani's presidency, or could it? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you want to start, Nazila? Um, very mm -hmm. quick on the Iranian cultural identity. I don't think any Iranian wants to give up uh, past traditions. Uh, I think this is true about countries with ancient uh, traditions uh, everywhere. Uh, Iranians have been very much uh, affected uh, by by global events, they, 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 the majority of Iranians feel they are more uh, citizens of a, uh, of, a, of a global culture than the Islamic Republic of Iran that has tried over the years to confine them and, and change their traditions. Uh, but it has nothing to do with giving up uh, Iranian traditions or practices. Uh, I haven't come across anyone who hasn't cherished uh, those cultural heritages, uh, everybody respects them. Even here in the US, I mean, we teach our children about Persian traditions, we celebrate Nowruz. 
and many other uh, uh, Persian uh, traditions. Um, but political partnership with China, I don't think either the Iranian society or the Iranian leaders have had a good experience uh, with China. I mean, first of all, there's this huge stigma. You speak to anyone in Iran, and they hate the fact that whatever they have, their shoes, their clothes, everything is made in China. And I, I tell them, listen, even in the States, everything is made in China. Yeah, but no, <laughs> Iranians don't want to buy anything that is made in China. They want to buy things that are made in Europe. They want to buy things that are made in the United States. I don't know how possible that is, but um, on a social level, these are uh, people's desires. Uh, I think Iranian leaders have always looked westward. Uh, they've always wanted to import technologies that were Western. Uh, they had no other options, and that's why they turned to Chinese uh, firms or even in terms of developing gas and oil fields, they had to turn to the Chinese. But if they have a choice, their first priority are American investors, then Europeans. I don't think uh, they would go for the Chinese. Rouhani, I think, has made uh, quite good achievements. I mean, I, I talk to young people, and they are a lot happier uh, than before 2009. I mean, people are optimistic. There were a lot of uh, pictures on the internet just this week about musicians on the streets. Uh, apparently, this, this has become very common. And this was non-existent. I don't remember ever a time somebody singing and dancing with an electric guitar on the street. Sometimes they were traditional singers, but they did it late in the afternoon, in the dark, and they were more treated like beggars than musicians. So things have changed um, under uh, Rouhani. He has managed to uh, draw the support of even a lot of uh, conservatives. I mean, during the elections, a lot of uh, more um, conservative figures backed him, partly because he, he appeared to be more competent. He made promises that a lot of people in society were also uh, talking about them. And he did become a uh, sort of a unifying figure, especially after 2009. Uh, I mean, we have to wait and see what's going to happen after a nuclear deal, whether there are going to be new, new uh, lines among Iranian leaderships. Uh, but so far, I think uh, inside Iran, people are very happy with, with Rouhani, especially if he can deliver the nuclear deal as well. Really? Um, I think on questions of identity, I mean, the Iranians have had a tremendous capacity over uh, their history really to absorb different cultural influences and often reproduce it better. You know, I mean, they often make it Iranian, basically. I mean, and so that identity is a, I, I don't see that as a particular uh, a problem of giving up anything. or What they do is they, they, they're in a relationship with the outside world. It is the crossroads of civilizations, after all, which means it's basically a mess. You know, I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's, everything goes in and out. And it produces something that is identifiably, I suppose you could say, Iranian or uh, Persian or however which way you want to describe it. And it does borrow a lot. I mean, it always has borrowed a lot. Um, if you go back to the Greeks, they talk about it. You know, I mean, they talk about the Persians actually being amongst the, the, the people who, who are most willing to adopt the practices of foreigners. Uh, but what they do is they turn it off into good effect. So I don't see the debate that I think you have in Iran today is really an internal debate about you know which aspect of the Iranian. Uh, character, if you if we could call it that, is is really going to win over. Uh, whether you do have these sort of more humanistic influences, which are very prominent throughout Iranian history in particular areas, and and of course, like all countries and societies, of course, every, you know, we always uh, there, there are periods of fanaticism, there are periods of moderation. I mean, it's it's uh, you know there are different pulls and, and pushes, but I don't see it as the Iranians giving up their identity for something utterly alien. The um, the Iranian. Sort of lay religious philosopher Abdul Karim Sarouj says that there's a, you know, Iranians have three cultural inheritances. One is their pre-Islamic inheritance, one is their Muslim inheritance, and the third, interestingly enough, is their Western inheritance. And they have absorbed all these, and they, they, they sort of reproduce them. So I think that the battle is an internal battle rather than one of adopting anything overseas. And it does have a durability, of course. I mean, you're right to say there's a degree of durability and there's also, you know, there's continuity and change. I think in the economy, I mean, the basic issue here is if you want to buy things and you want to buy a lot of cheap things, you can go to China. But if you want to get technical expertise, you have to come to the West. And they know that, by the way. I mean, and this is particularly true over the nuclear industry. I mean, one of the things that I'm very interested to see about the nuclear talks, if you notice, I mean, one of the aspects of the fact sheet that came out, which I think is going to be very important, in fact, it might have actually been in the Lausanne Declaration as well, that, you know, um, uh, one of the aspects was safety. You know, safety and making sure that uh, every facility, you know, that would be some sort of measure of, 
uh, making sure that the, the facilities were up to a certain international standard. You talk to Iranians, and those in the know, you know, the technology and the, and, and, and the equipment they want and the investment they want is certainly coming from the West. And by the West, I include Japan, by the way. Okay? So it's, it's that sort of... Uh, that's why I don't see China at the moment as being, you know, they talk a lot about selling oil to China, that's fine. You know. But in terms of investing in their oil, oil industry, really what they need are Western oil companies to come and invest. I mean, that's what they need. And as for the nuclear industry, again, I guarantee you that they, what they want is Western technology. Um, I, I think your point is, you know, on a, on a theoretical level, and, and, but, you know, one of the, again, one of the great tragedies for me when you're talking, is the Iranians who know, know what the problem was. You know, they, they've looked back and they've seen the mistakes that were made. I mean, they know full well what the issues were. And the issues were really, in that sense, to put it very simplistically in a way, but as you say, you know, was that the Khatami the reformists battled Rafsanjani and it, the whole thing, you know, went into a bit of a fiasco. I mean, I, you know, I remember at the time, you know, I also was very critical of Rafsanjani at the time, and a lot of people said to me, you know, you're being very short-sighted, so on and so forth. But that was the mood at the time. Rafsanjani represented this very centrist, you know, Akbar Shah, as they called him, and all this sort of thing. And uh, um, I think now there is a realization. The problem is, is how this can be, you know, to use that awful word, you know, operationalized. You know, I mean, that's the problem. And how you bring these two, because they are there. And you saw that very, very vividly in Rouhani's election when you had, I think in the week after his election, Khatami Rafsanjani going to congratulate Rouhani. I mean, these were the two wings. They had, they had come back together. They were together as well. My problem has been really is that both these figures have been hammered since then, you know. And for me, Rouhani, the problem of Rouhani for me is not him as an individual, his outlook, whatever. It's that he lacks a constituency of his own. And really, the people that brought him in were Rafsanjani and Khatami. They brought in the constituents. If you remember at the time, I mean, it was a very strange election. Um, lots of people were going to boycott that election. And yet Khatami came out, he stuck his neck out, and he said, vote. And this is not the time for the end of the Persian word. was So off you go and vote. But also Khamenei, if you remember, came out and said, even if you don't like the system, vote for the honor of the country. You know, they wanted people. So there, there's a sort of a, you know, I think there was a lot of, um, uh, uh, I wouldn't want to say tactical voting, but strategic foresight. I mean, I know RF was standing, he stepped down, so that brought, the question is how that, as I said, now moves forward. And I think if you read, you'll see uh, that that sort of centrist, reformist distinction has merged. I mean, people understand that. But the question is now how do you put that into practice? So, you know, that's what you know, people like myself are really waiting to see. You know, we want to see some tangible results of that. So two final questions. Sir, the second row, you had a, you had a question. Thank you. Thank you for Sorry. organizing this uh, great panel. Uh, my name is Malcolm Byrne. I'm at uh, uh, the National Security Archive at George Washington University, ah. where I helped to run a, uh, a series of conferences looking at the history of U.S.-Iran relations, and, and Karim has actually been at one of those. Uh, and w there are many striking things that come out of these, these conferences, which involve former policymakers from the U.S., Iran, and other countries. Uh, where they sit around and talk to each other about what happened and what they were thinking and why they believed uh, what they did. So uh, a lot of surprising things, a lot of things that may not be surprising but are still striking. And one of those is how little each side has understood about the other. Martin mm -hmm. Indyk at one point uh, sort of threw up his arms and said, the Iranian decision-making system is simply a black box to the rest of us. So um, uh, the good news seems to me anyway to be that uh, on the U.S. side, subsequent you know, consecutive U.S. presidents have seemed to understand the process better and made more uh, thoughtful and effective approaches to the other side. Uh, so first of all, would you agree with that? And secondly, if this isn't too vague a question, are, are there any particular points of misunderstanding or lack of information on either side that uh, you all, all three of you, would identify as, as key to resolving any uh, outstanding issues? Thank, Thank you. you, Malcolm. Is there any questions in the back? Um, please. I'll get you the last one. 
Uh, thank you very much, Karim. Uh, my name is Behnam. I'm an Iran research analyst at FTD. I have a quick uh, two-prong question, one for Nazila and one for Professor Ansari. Uh, Nazila, you mentioned uh, earlier that the lexicon had changed since the 80s specifically. Do you really believe that? Uh, the Iran-Iraq war is battled every day in, in the Iranian headlines. Qasem Soleimani and Major General Jaffrey talk about exporting the revolution on a daily basis, and those four Arab capitals they mentioned specifically, Damascus and Syria. Um, I was wondering what your take on that is with the change lexicon and discourse. And for Professor Ansari, I was wondering if you could um, re-highlight some of the impacts of an influx of cash into Iran with sanctions relieved hypothetically in a post-deal environment. You mentioned that this would exacerbate the existing trend lines, uh, squeezing the private sector, IRGC front companies, more parastatal institutions. You know, Treasury still designates the Iranian banking sector as a sector of money laundering concern. Uh, what would that look like on the back end of a deal? Thank you. And this gentleman has been very patient. And has the final word from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Kurtzig, who was the Iranian desk officer for the Department of Agriculture for many years. I want to switch a little bit. You talked about, and you asked the question about the future and the hope and so on. A country that has hope has children, but the fertility rate in Iran has dropped precipitously. So there's not much hope there because you don't want to bring children in such a miserable condition. Num number two, are there jobs in Iran? Are the schools training people so that they're marketable in the Iranian economy? Thank you. Thanks for taking my question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So <clears throat> why don't we, um, um, do you want to you start or give Ali the last word? Um, <laughs> sure. You can carry on, yeah. And let me, it gives me time to think. <laughs> Quickly, Malcolm's question. Uh, yeah, the fertility rate has uh, dropped, and I think a lot of people inside the country are happy about that because uh, the uh, the population boom of, of the 80s, uh, uh, especially early 80s, uh, produced this huge population, young population, and, and the government was not capable of producing jobs for them. Unemployment is still high in Iran. Uh, the economy is in a terrible shape. Uh, but I, I look at it from a different perspective. Uh, the, the Islamic Republic... Uh, had one very positive achievement, and that was uh, the, 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 especially the revolutionary regime of Khomeini drew a lot of people from the villages, especially the women, especially women who came from traditional families, religious families, who would have uh, stayed in their villages, in their homes, got married. If they worked, they, they would have probably worked in the cottage industry, nothing beyond that. But Khomeini drew a lot of these people uh, from the margins of society, brought them into the center, when, when I was growing up, these, these women, these young women from villages, started coming to our schools. They called themselves morality teachers. Uh, we couldn't understand them. They spoke with a, with a different accent. They were from the villages. So they kept on warning us about things that they had no idea what they were. I remember in those days, listening to music was, was not permitted. So they warned us about having band, And what they really meant was a Walkman. Uh, but the irony is that Akvan in Persian means original packaging. So, I mean, they had no idea what these words meant and uh, what they were warning us about. What happened was that by the time I was in, in, in high school, a uh, lot of these women were, I mean, even their appearances were changing. They were wearing braces. They wanted to look like the rest of the people in the city. By the 90s, a lot of these women became Islamist feminists. They had gone to university. They had become educated. Um, uh, a lot of these people, their husbands had fought in the war. Some of them had lost their husbands in the war, and once they lost their husbands, they started feeling the, the brutality of the Islamic law because according to the Islamic law, which was introduced after the revolution, their children didn't belong to them. They had to give up their children to paternal grandfathers. So a lot of these women became what we call them Islamist feminists. Uh, and today, they are a force of change in Iran. These women have raised totally different children. Uh, education levels are quite high in Iran. Uh, women have become increasingly more educated than men in Iranian society. Uh, in 1983, 30% of university students were women. By 2000, more than half were women. Last year, in many universities around the country, more than 70% of uh, the students were women. And you know, this is a sign. This is a sign that Iranian women have completely changed, and this is because of the revolution.
because a lot of these families wouldn't have allowed their daughters to go to the city to go to university. But after the revolution, they thought, they thought society was safe. It was Islamic. Um, so education levels have increased. Uh, in terms of jobs, you're absolutely right. A lot of people um, don't have jobs, a lot of women. Uh, but employment rates for women uh, reached almost the same level as before the revolution. Uh, but th there was a difference. A lot of women worked at the cottage industry before the revolution. They worked in the rice paddies. But now a lot of these women are doctors, engineers. They, they work in management levels. So in that sense, Iranian demographic has changed profoundly. Whether the lexicon has changed, I can give you an example. Uh, the first uh, decade of the revolution, all we heard was about Mustazafin, uh, was about Taqutis, uh, was about going to Karbala only because Ali was buried there. Are, we, are they talking about those things, about those religious ideals, or are they talking about political ambitions? I think that's where the shift has occurred. Uh, in, those, in the early days of the revolution, it was all about a, a religious ideology. But now it's more about uh, political ambitions. Um, and um, the, the, uh, back to Malcolm's question, um, I, I think we have to um, uh, be thankful to two people in what has in this breakthrough. Uh, I was really amazed at John Kerry and Javad Zarif's um, persistence to carry on the talks. Uh, that week in Lausanne, uh, there were all these messages that we were hearing from uh, reporters who were there. And they were exhausted. And their exhaustion suggested that, OK, the talks are going to end up in a failure. Somebody's going to quit. Somebody's going to resign. This had happened in the past, especially on the side of Iranian negotiators, uh, including uh, Ali Larijani or Javad Larijani. Which one was uh, Ali Larijani? Uh, he quit, I mean, because he reached an agreement. He went back. Iranians didn't accept the agreement, so he quit. Uh, but this time, Javad Zarif stayed there. I think uh, his only problem was not dealing with the Americans, but was also going back and checking things back home with um, Iranian leadership. Um, there was definitely a very strong um, uh, willingness on the side of Iranians to, to reach a deal. But the fact that there were two people who, who were determined uh, to carry on the talks uh, and uh, give diplomacy a chance, I think, made a huge difference this time. <clears throat> Ali, before I hand it off to you, I just wanted to say one thing in response to Malcolm's question. First is that um, I, I think the, the book that uh, your group did, Malcolm, was, I think, one of the, 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 the more interesting and informative pieces of literature about US-Iran relations that's come out in the last decade. What, what was the title again? Becoming enemies, and I think the, the the importance of it, and it's something which is commonly misunderstood in the U.S. is that, from the Iranian perspective, from the Islamic Republic uh, perspective, the thing that um, has angered them most and created the most resentment um, among the Iranian leadership was what they perceived as the U.S. support for Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq War. And I thought um, you did a you guys did a brilliant job of shedding light on that history. And I think there's another point which is commonly misunderstood, which is that the United States keeps apologizing for the 1953 coup against Mossadegh. And you know, I tell people if Mohammed Mossadegh were alive today, the Islamic Republic would either throw him in jail or execute him. So he is not someone who we should keep apologizing to Iran's leadership for overthrowing Mossadegh. They were also opposed to Mossadegh. Well, I think you guys put your finger on it. It's 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 the the the. The, the, the history of the Iran-Iraq war, which is something not commonly understood for many people here. And then second, um, I do think, you know, your question was the evolution of U.S. understanding about how decisions are made in Iran. And, you know, one way we can see that evolution is how President Obama has been writing num numerous letters to the Supreme Leader. I think he's written four or five personal letters to the Supreme Leader. And that was unprecedented. Never uh, had a U.S. president reached out to, 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 to Khamenei directly. And, and, and on the contrary, I remember during the Clinton administration, Mohammed Khatami was elected president, and the Clinton administration tried to kind of engage the reformists and strengthen the reformists and, and weaken those hardline forces in, in Tehran. So I think that there certainly has been uh, an evolution in the U.S. understanding of how of, of the power structure within Iran, 
I don't know if there's necessarily been an evolution in our understanding of how decisions are made in Iran. Frankly, I don't think that most Iranians understand how decisions are, are taken within the country, who's in the room, how those decisions are made. But in terms of the, the architecture of power in the Islamic Republic, I think there's a much better understanding than there was, say, a decade or so ago. But I'll give Ali the last word. Um, thank you very much. I, I, uh, let me talk about the birth rate. And I, I mean, we were talking about, uh, because that's fairly quick. I mean, that there was a, uh, certainly among what we would term, or what we would consider a middle class, was a reluctance to have uh, uh, more and more children. But, um, I mean, recently Khamenei has asked people, you know, he wants the population to double in the next 10 or 20 years or whatever it is. So um, he's encouraging them, and they've withdrawn a lot of uh, assistance to, uh, you know, the, the, the free uh, contraceptives and stuff have all been now sort of uh, removed to encourage the population to go. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's uh, he wants uh, he wants to replenish the uh, replenish the uh, resource, I guess. Um, and partly it's uh, you know the view that we have an aging population, therefore we need a younger population to be able to, to support. But I, I mean, I do know that there are many within the uh, uh, the the more you know the Ministry of Economics and others who who view this with great trepidation that they're going to suddenly have to find resources for 150 million people rather than uh, 75 or 90, whatever it is. Um, in terms of uh, capacity building, I mean, one of the interesting things is that, as I said, there has been a lost decade. So there is, you know, there's a very well-educated population, but well-educated in what? Um, and uh, the question is, and it goes back also to the economics, you know, when you look at it, um, I found it very interesting. I mean, we did, I used to go to lots and lots of conferences in the 1990s, in the, in the, in the, you know, when lots of businesses were discussing, you know, about the prospect of going to Iran. And, and there was always there a little bit of a sort of a semantic uh, misunderstanding about what people meant in terms of private enterprise uh, investment, this sort of thing. But I think now the, the problems are even probably bigger in some ways. Uh, uh, partly because the, that 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 decade has, you know, the, the things have developed in the West. For instance, on on lovely topics like compliance and anti-bribery laws and anti-corruption and so on and so forth that we all have to sign uh, very regularly these days. I mean, I think people are going to do business in Iran and Iranian businesses coming out to the West will suddenly find that the environment has changed. Certainly, when they're coming to Europe and the United States. So I think you know there there are things that need to be done. Uh, there there is sort of a business education, if I can put it that way, that needs to be. Uh, that needs to be built. And I think, you know, to go to your point, I th uh, the back, I mean, I, th I think for me the problem is, is if the structures of that economy have not changed substantially, all that will happen is that money will go in, it will flow into the regular areas, and it will be recycled out again in a way. Um, and, you know, you can look at, you know, the, the economy under Khatami when oil was $7 a barrel, and the economy under Ahmadinejad when oil was $60 a barrel and rising. And what happened to that money then? Uh, I mean, if you look at rich kids in Tehran, you can see that some of the money went into very interesting places. I actually saw some pictures on websites of the most extraordinary houses being built in Rasht and other places. I mean, I think the Shah would have blushed had he <laughs> built a house this side. I mean, I, I, I kid you not, it's far bigger than Niavaran, I have to tell you. Um, so there is money. I mean, there's money there, and there's a huge amount of money. But it's a little bit, you know, what gets me is it's a little bit like the sort of the oligarchical mentality in Russia. You know, I mean, there are certain people making lots of money. There are other people that are not, and I think the, the, these are fairly well guided. So I, that is a problem. And I, but, but you know, to go back to a previous question, I mean, there are people in Iran who know full well what the problems are. You know, one of the things that they have to do in Iran is to sort out the irrigation in this country. We're running out of water. You know, I mean, this is a it's a catastrophe. I have to tell you uh, that the Ministry of Agriculture will go and say, actually, we're ex extracting so much water. Uh, the, from the ground, and we're not replenishing it, that, you know, in 20 years' time, we're all going to be dry. Um, so, I mean, th these are issues that need to be handled and handled and, and dealt with very quickly. Adam Malcolm's right. I'm very, first of all, very pleased to meet you in person, because I... <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, very nice to see you. Um, I'm going to be slightly... I'm going to be slightly... In, in the interest of a couple of my students here, actually, I'm going to also be slightly uh, 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 contrarian with you in this. One is I'm going to say, I think that the American understanding of Iran has grown in leaps and bounds. But the baseline was low. Mm. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest about it. When I started working on this thing, and I, I written it in my own book, you know, there's this wonderful line of Condoleezza Rice, you know, ringing up and saying, uh, it's probably apocryphal, but it has a certain truth to, you know, how many people in the State Department on working on Iran? And the answer came back, one. You know, I mean, this was, and how many people with Persian? And I, I have a number of friends of mine who are very good Persianists, but would be appointed to desks out in the Caribbean, you know, this sort of thing. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of a, a foreign ministry problem that happens everywhere, by the way. I mean, I'm not saying it's particular to Iran. I think the capacity in the United States has grown exponentially. 
I mean, I think it's been really fantastic to see how it's grown. In terms of understanding decision making, however, where I'm going to say is that there's a certain amount of, you know, there is room to grow, if I can put it that way. I don't think anyone necessarily understands precisely how the decision making is, is, is done, principally because, of course, there is a single decision maker at the back end of it. You know, it's not that we're thinking of Khamenei as some sort of great omnipotent dictator or whatever. I don't think that ever works. But the fact is, in 2009, it was made very clear that he has the last word. And that was always the decision. You know, when it was about the election, nobody debated whether it was fraud or not because he had the last word. He'd spoken. That was it. And, and I think in this case, he has that. So who feeds into that decision-making process or his, his ideas? It's, it's often difficult, as Karim says, to work out who's actually sitting on this high table and discussing things with him. But I do think, and I'm going to finish off with this, because I said, as I said, for the benefit of my students who are here, just a little bit of nostalgia for them. Um, there's a wonderful, wonderful quote, I have to say. And I'm going to go back before 53, unfortunately, from Lord Curzon. And I know, you're gonna, I know they're going to sign. And he, he complains about British policy towards Iran in the 19th century. And he says the trouble with us in our policy towards Iran is we, either, we, we, we vacillate between the sort of the white heat of excitement and then the sort of the dullness of boredom of disinterest. And I think the problem with Western, and this is, actually goes to the heart of where my concerns are over this whole nuclear negotiation. And someone put the point out very, he said these negotiations are like a roller coaster. And they are, you know. And what I'm trying to say, I think, to people, is rather than have great big highs and then followed by dramatic lows and the emotional roller coaster that this is dealing with, let's try and level it a bit and approach it with a slightly more sober, uh, level-headed uh, uh, um, approach to it all. Because I think the Iranians also, by the way, when it comes when they say the Iranians are very good at negotiating. And there are very good chess players in Iran. We know there are also some very good, I mean, Karim says there are very good people who play chicken, and there are very good people who play poker, and, they're very, you know, and there are good chess, but not everyone's a good chess player in Iran, and I think that cliche is often overused. Um, but one of the things about it, and you'll see this in, in the cycle of negotiations, is that ability to basically have this sort of emotional roller coaster. And the excitement I see after the Lausanne Declaration is really that after 18 months of no movement at all, when we all thought it was about to fail, suddenly they come out with this dramatic announcement that it's all been a success. And the excitement is palpable. But, you know, the point about that is it's been a very good case of information management in some ways, because when you look at the detail, sometimes things are not as clear as they should be. And I would far prefer that when we approach the, uh, the other side, the Iranians, or the Iranians approaching the Americans, or the Europeans, obviously, is that we didn't have this roller coaster mentality that we approached it in a far more sober way. We learned those lessons. We understand what the negotiating tactics of the other side are and appreciate that really, you know, we can afford to be perhaps uh, a little bit more laid back about the approach, uh, uh, about what's going on. I have to say, one of the things I will say, and I'll finish with this, is Zarif has played his hand extremely well. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I think he's done a spectacular job, actually. But he's done a spectacular job, really, in turning, as I said, somewhere, you know, America has now become the suitor, and Iran can afford to be coy. And that, I have to say, is uh, all credit to him from a purely objectively diplomatic point of view. Uh, but I think it shows that actually from the other side, there needs to be a little bit of, you know, we need to, uh, uh, we need to uh, I suppose, adjust our, uh, uh, adjust our, um, our, our understanding a little bit more, refine it a bit more. There is room. There is room for improvement, as I would say. So I'd like to thank you for your thoughtful questions. Thank you guys for your thoughtful thank answers. You. And um, you're, you're around. Yeah, yeah, I'll be around. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so will I see you?